أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا وسيد الأولين والآخرين بالقاسم محمد I think we're still waking up. Let's have a louder salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin al-ma'sumin al-muntakhabin al-muntajabin al-mazlumin al-lazina athab Allahu anhum al-rijsa wa tahharahum tathira. Sallu ala al-nabi. Amma ba'd, my respected brothers and sisters, my elders, learned scholars, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, we mentioned last week about one of the things which we can do to further propagate the identities of the Ahlul Bayt Allah, to make people aware of who are the Ahlul Bayt and one of the methods we said is the naming of our children with names befitting of the personalities of the Ahlul Bayt Allah. I'm sure most of you are aware today we're celebrating the birthday of one of our young members uh, she's turning one years old inshallah and the name that's being given to her is Narjis uh, most of the people ask well where is this name Narjis you know is it Indian is it Iranian where did it come from so I wanted inshallah today to focus on this name primarily for two reasons one as a celebration of one of our community's birth as well as an approach for us as a Shia community to become more aware of the personality who embodies this name and the reason why we have adopted this name for our children so that inshallah as this young Narjis grows up in this community we will be able to remind her of who is this personality that the name was gifted from remember we said last week that our beloved Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam Allah sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad when his companion told him that he had chosen the name Fatima for his firstborn or for one of his daughters the Imam alayhi salam Allah emphasized to him he said never raise your voice nor raise your hand at her let the name be her educator now the name by itself if the child doesn't understand who is Fatima and is not raised in a community that speaks about Fatima alayhi salam Allah, then the name will primarily not have much of an effect. And this is not to say, you know, Sunni Shia or Muslim, non-Muslim, but we see the name Fatima in our community and we see the name Fatima in other communities. And we see the difference of the importance given to people who have the name Fatima. In some communities, specifically when I was in New York, I met an uh, African American who had converted to the religion of Islam at the age of 20. He passed away two years ago. He passed away at the age of 70 something. He became a Shia of the Ahlul Bayt at the age of 68 thereabouts, in the last four to five years of his life. And when I'm asked him, I said, what is the one thing that made you want to become a Shia of the Ahlul Bayt? And subhanallah, for all the time that he was a Muslim, the masjid which he goes to is in Brooklyn, is right opposite a Shia masjid. And he says, for all this time in this masjid, they're telling us, keep away from these Rawafid, keep away from these Iranians, keep away from these, you know, and Shia Islam is being labeled as an Iranian religion. But he says, one day I saw African Americans coming out of the masjid. And they began to converse with me saying, you know, you're one of us. You should come and visit us in our center and see what we learn. And I said, no, you should visit in my center. So we agreed to visit each other's centers. And when I went to their center, I heard for the first time the name Fatima. He said, all this time in the other masjid, I'm just hearing about Ashab al-Rasul, the companions of Rasulullah. I wasn't even aware that Rasulullah had a family. So then I heard about Fatima. And I began to research about Fatima. And the more I researched about Fatima, the more I fell in love with the Ahlul Bayt. And I decided that it is only right for me 
to follow the family of the prophet as opposed to the companions of the prophet and he says his name that he chose when he decided to embrace the path of the Ahlul Bayt he chose the name as Abdul Zahra can you imagine African American walking around and you say to him you know what's your name he says Abdul Zahra that is as Iranian as you can get right so he called himself Abdul Zahra and he speaks highly of Fatima to Zahra the point I'm highlighting is what that it's not only enough for us to give the name to the child the community should be well acquainted with this name and here we found a person who lived an entire life in a community not knowing the importance of the name and therefore whenever he heard the name Fatima he never really associated it with the origin of Sayyidat Nisa'il Alameen Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad So who is Lady Nargis or as we call her Nargis Khatun and this is specifically for the children so maybe if the parents can just sit them down they'll be able to benefit insha'Allah Nargis Khatun alayha afdal salatu wassalam is a personality that historians are still disputing to this very day as to whether she was you know Roman or was she Persian or was she of African descent or was she of Indian descent because you know in that age so many empires invading one another you found that you know people would move from one origin to another origin prime example today we're in America you can turn around and say I am an American Muslim maybe a hundred years from now historians would read about Muhammad or Mustafa or Layla or Zainab or whoever and the book will say they were an American Muslim but now the book may not say that you were actually of Persian descent and you came to America or you were of Indian descent and you came to America it just labels you as American because on your identity on your passport it says born in the United States America in that time likewise there were people moving from one part of the world to another part of the world and nobody was really you know no one can say for sure whether lady Nargis Khatun Allah, was Roman or was she from another empire as was customary that people from one empire would marry into another empire in order to solidify power so there was really a lot of ambiguity about her now there is a reason we believe that there is ambiguity about her origin in the same way that there is ambiguity about Sayyida Fidda alayhi salam Allah Fidda alayhi salam some people say she was from Ethiopia some people say no she wasn't from Ethiopia she was from a different part of India and she was captured by the African invading army and whatever it may be and later on she remained as part of Africa and then when Islam conquered that part of the world she joined the Muslim community the key thing to remember here and this is something for us to be you know uh, mindful of is that the women of the Ahlul Bayt and the women that were associated with the Ahlul Bayt their hijab was such a hijab that the closest people around them could not even tell their ethnic origin because they did not get to see their faces so even Sayyida Fidda alayha salamullah we have narrations that say on the day of Ashura when that La'een Shimr alayhi lanatullah wanted to curse Sayyida Zainab he said whom amongst you is Zainab and in order to protect Sayyida Zainab from being sworn at Sayyida Fidda alayhi salam Allah came forward and said I am Zainab and they believed that she was Zainab because nobody knew the daughters of the Risala and nobody knew the women who lived in the uh, house of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam Allah because their hijab was such Sayyida Zainab when she describes her hijab after Ashura she says I am Zainab my own shadow has never seen me without a khidr my own shadow has never seen my face because I'm always in hijab Sayyida Zahra alayhi salam Allah when we described or the hijab is described to us she used to wear seven different layers of hijab 
not just so that people could not tell her figure, salawatullahi wasalamu alayha, but people could not even tell her height. She wanted it very vague. Her hijab was as such. So when we talk about Lady Nargis alayhi salamullah, you will find when you read books, that some books say she was from the Roman Empire, some books say, no, she was of Indian origin, captured by the Romans, and therefore she remained in the high court of the, Persian, uh, of the Roman Empire. And some narrations say, no, she was of African descent, she was of African royalty, captured by the Romans, and then later on she escaped. But the point that I'm trying to make is, we shouldn't be bound about the origin of her ethnicity. It suffices for us to know that her hijab was such that even whilst she was living in a non-Muslim society, nobody could say her origin. But she is such a great personality that all three great empires, the Persian Empire, or the Indians at the time, as well as the African empires, as well as the Romans, every one of them wanted to claim her as their own, because her akhlaq, because her adab, because her etiquettes, because her piety in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was of the highest rank that everybody wanted to say she belonged to our community. So how did she move from the Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire to the Muslim world? The story found in all of our books such as Bihar al-Anwar Usul al-Kafi and every book which details the marriage of the Imam Imam al-Hasan al-Askari alayhi salam Allah to Lady Nargis Khatun alayhi salam Allah details it in the following way we begin with the salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad She lived in the Byzantine Empire in the capital and she was renowned for her taqwa and her iman for being God conscious, for being mindful of her Lord. Her hijab was renowned and everyone who was of notable lineage was proposing to her in order to have her as a wife. And she would refuse everyone saying their faith and my faith are not equals. Until the high priest recommended for the son of the emperor, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire which is the Roman Empire the second part of the Roman Empire's history had recommended that they marry the son to Sayyidah Nargis Khatun and this being that it's the, you know, the son of the emperor or the emperor himself every noble not just in the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, but every noble from everywhere. So for example, when you know someone becomes voted as a president in the United States, all the delegations, the notables of all the other countries come to the United States to give you know congratulations or they make a phone call because it's an event which is of the you know leadership of a particular powerful community so therefore everybody else wants to curry favor with this powerful community so now we have the narration saying that when Lady Nargis alayhi salam Allah was about to be wed and the vows were about to be recited by the highest priest of the time who is like the Pope for the Roman Catholics all the delegations had come to the seat of power and they were sitting down and they were ready to witness this blessed union when all of a sudden this ginormous cross that was left in the palace or in the church, as soon as they bring out Lady Nargis alayhi salam Allah, and they are about to recite the vows of marriage between Lady Nargis alayhi salam Allah and the you know, uh, prince or the emperor, the cross falls. The first time the narration says it just fell off the wall. Now given that this is the symbol of Catholicism, and it fell in front of everyone, it was considered to be a bad omen. So immediately the marriage was halted. And they said, you know, we will postpone to another day. Maybe today is not a good day for this marriage to go through. A second time the marriage was about to take place and the festivities and all else. But this time not only did it fall, but it cracked into two and then fell. 
And this was seen to be as the worst omen because the first time could have been regarded as a coincidence. But the second time, it's something different. And when it fell, some narrations say it destroyed the throne of the emperor. And everyone saw it that Lady Narjis was a bad omen and a curse. So she became undesirable. And she was left to her own and nobody really wanted to communicate with her anymore around the world entirely because many people had witnessed this event unfold. So at this moment in time, Lady Narjis begins to feel as if she is truly cursed. But this is a woman who prays to Allah often, who makes donations towards charitable causes and you know the orphans and so on and so forth. So now she really begins to go in this, not a cycle of depression, nor is it doubt, but questioning. Oh Allah, what have I done for me to be shunned in such a way by everyone? Until one night she has a dream where in that dream she sees Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam sallallahu alayhi wa Walking in front of him is Jesus the son of Mary and next to Rasulullah is Sayyidatu Nisa al Alameen on one side and Amir al Mu'mineen on another side and Al Imam al Hassan and Al Hussein and along with them Al Imam al Hassan al Askari and she recognized Isa ibn Maryam, she recognized Jesus the son of Mary and he introduced to her that this is Ahmad and he is the seal of prophets after me and he came to me proposing that you become the wife of his grandson Al Imam Al Hassan Al Askari because you are the most pious and virtuous woman of your time and that through this blessed union Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send forth my supporter of truth and my Imam Al Hujjat ibn Al Hassan Ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu al sharif sallu ala Muhammadin wa alihi So I have come to speak on your behalf and I have come to seek your consent to say to Rasulullah that they can come and ask for the hand of marriage on behalf of Al-Imam Al-Hassan Al-Askari At that moment she says, I immediately accepted. And when I accepted, it was Sayyidat Nisa Al-Alameen who conversed with me and proposed that I be the wife of Al-Imam Al-Hassan Al-Askari in the dream, and this is one of the miracles, this is one of the, and we don't say it is a hilm, we say ru'ya. It is the world of vision. In the alam of the ru'ya, Rasulullah himself recited the vows between Al Imam Al Hassan Al Askari and Sayyid Al Narjis Khatun. And some narrations say that Isa ibn Maryam was the wakil who recited on behalf of Sayyidina Najis Khatun alayhi salam Allah and Rasulullah was the wakil for Al-Imam Al-Hassan alayhi salam Allah. After this blessed union, the narrations continue to say that Imam Al-Hassan alayhi salam Allah would visit her in the alam of the ru'ya many a time and he would teach her about usul al-deen, about furu' al-deen, about ahkam of the deen, about the Qur'an until her piety and her ma'rifa also was excelled to another level. Now some people turn around and say, how is this possible? Well, we have a prophet who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an entire chapter in the Quran about him, Nabiullah Yusuf, who the entire communication between Allah and Nabi Yusuf was always through visions and dreams. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. إِذْ قَالَ يُوسُفُ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَتَاهِ until the end of it, when Joseph said unto his father, O father, I saw in a dream the entire revelation of Nabi Allah Yusuf alayhi salam Allah, the education of Yusuf alayhi salam Allah was in a dream. So then why is it impossible for it to reoccur? The Ahlul Bayt here alayhi salam Allah described this occurrence beautifully. A person came to Al-Imam Ali ibn Musa Ridha alayhi salatu wa salam sallallahu alayhi wa 
And he said to him that your Shia boast that you have the power to intercede and that you have the power to see visions and that you have the power to make dua and supplication and not only that but you have wilaya taqweeniya which means you have authority over all the creation something which Nabiullah Sulaiman alayhi salam Allah had a portion of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and we gave Solomon authority over the winds and over the jinns and over the shayateen so this is called wilaya taqweeniya authority over the creation Amir al-Mu'mineen returned the sun because he had authority over the creation whatever he tells the creation the creation will submit to him so he says to the imam he says your shia boast that you have this authority wilaya taqweeniya can you prove it to me so the imam alayhi salam Allah beautifully proves the point there was a small fly buzzing around in the room the imam alayhi salam Allah looks at the individual and he says to him let me ask you if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to dispose all his powers the power to say to thing be and it becomes the power to send prophets the power to hold the entire universe in his control if Allah wanted to dispose and deposit all this power into this tiny fly can Allah do so or no the man turned around and said this fly doesn't have the he said I didn't ask you if the fly has the ability can Allah give his entire authority to this fly yes or no and if Allah wanted to give it to the fly can the fly withstand it yes or no if Allah wanted it to have that capacity he said absolutely Allah innahu ala kulli shayin qadir he said then if you doubt that we have wilaya taqweeniya it is not that you're doubting our ability but it is your doubting Allah's ability to entrust to some of his servants then the Imam reads the ayah of the Quran al Kareem Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim so then do they become envious of what we have bestowed upon our servants the Imam is saying that whenever we have something from Allah it's not that we are special it is that Allah chose us from his creation to deposit his trust in us in the same way that Allah deposits trust in his prophets but after we proved ourselves to be worthy that we desired nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah chose us for this the narrations continue to say that Imam al-Askari alayhi salam Allah continued to teach and educate Sayyidina Narjis Khatun alayhi salam Allah until there came a day when she says to the Imam alayhi salam Allah in a vision O oh, the son of Rasulullah my patience has come to an end I can no longer bear to be distant away from you so when is our union going to be a wife has a right on her husband and a husband has rights on his wife and Allah knows that I have been patient but when am I going to carry this blessed child who is the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth when will I be able to be in your company so the Imam alayhi salam Allah says to her Al-Faraj, which means the appearance of our situation, the time of our union, will be very close. And then the Imam describes to her what will happen. He says, a group of Muslims will enter into a small battle with a group of the Romans. And therefore, at that time, you should dress up as one of the helping maids for the army, one of the women who tends to the wounds of the men and take along with you one of your servants and take enough money for you to get to the borders where the battle will take place when this battle will take place the Muslims will be victorious and when they are victorious they will take the people captives allow yourself to be captured do not escape when you are captured then they will try and sell you in a market the Abbasid caliphs were known to buy and sell slaves they will try to sell you in a market I will send my servant to buy you and to bring you to the home and in this way you will leave that empire and you will enter into my home without any kind of dispute between the two communities 
And here the beauty is that the Imam alayhi salam Allah foretold everything and truthfully it all happened. She was captured and when she was captured and she was being sold in the market, everyone was trying to outbid the other person to take Sayyidah Narjis Khatun alayhi salam Allah because her name was far in the land as one of the, if not the most pious woman of her generation. And whenever somebody wanted to buy her, there was one person who was outbidding everyone. And then in the end, he won the bid and she turned to him and she said, I seek the words of the Virgin Mary. I seek refuge from you in Allah if you are indeed a pious person. And he hands her over this letter, which he knows nothing of his content. But he hands her over this letter and she opens this letter, which is sealed and she recognized the seal from the ring of Al Imam Al Hassan Al Askari when she saw him in Alam Al Ru'ya. And when she breaks the seal, she opens the letter, and the Imam alayhi salam Allah says, Do not dispute with him, go with him, for he will bring you to me, and then inshaAllah we will be reunited. At that moment, the narration says she begins to weep and she begins to kiss the letter. The servant doesn't know that the Imam would see her in the Alam of the Ru'ya. And he said to her, O oh lady, why do you weep? My master will be good to you. He is the best of masters. I too was once a slave. And he bought me and he freed me. But I chose to remain with him because of his greatness, because of his akhlaq, because of his adab. So she says to him, O oh servant of Allah, you do not know how eager I have been to smell the fragrance of the Ahlul Bayt salam Allah. For in this letter is the first time I have something that is physically connected to my Imam. And the guy becomes extremely astonished that she understood who the Imam is. And when she gets to the house of the Imam alayhi salam Allah, he recognizes that the Imam alayhi salam Allah is actually married to Sayyidah Najis Khatun. And the remainder of it remains secret. The beauty of Lady Narjis Khatun alayhi salam Allah, something for our sisters as well as our brothers to understand. For the cause and for the well-being of the Imam of our time. Can you imagine that in your own home you have a husband, but you have to play out the remainder of your life that you are not his wife. That you are his slave. You are his servant. A maid. And you can never really tell him that you love him. And you can never get close to him in front of anyone. Because the moment people find out you are his wife. They will try to kill you. Because the Abbasid Khalifas had put six servants in the house of the Imam. Every one of them was a spy. One of the wives of the Imam that he was forced to marry was equally a spy. And the Imam alayhi salam Allah could not reveal that Sayyidah Narjis Khatun was actually his wife. Nor could Sayyidah Narjis Khatun reveal to the people that she is the wife of the Imam. And even her pregnancy was a secret and the birth of the Imam was also secret. But this noble lady, Lady Narjis Khatun alayhi salam Allah, for the well-being of the Imam, willingly and freely moved from being the daughter of nobility and being someone who was contended over in the courts of the emperors to living in a humble abode of an Imam who was a prisoner, who was known as Al-Askari because he was surrounded by more than 10,000 soldiers for all of his life, every one of them waiting to hear that he was, you know, married and his wife is about to give birth to the twelfth Imam, so that they can kill him and that they can kill the Imam. And Lady Narjis Khatun alayhi salam Allah, she has this sabr which is immense, and she has this trust which is immense, and she has this secret which is immense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distinguished her from all the women of the world that only she will carry Al-Hujjat ibn Al-Hasan Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Faraj al-Sharif Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad One incident which is recorded in Bihar al-Anwar a 
beautiful incident which highlights to us the status of Lady Nargis Khatun As a matter of fact, there are two incidents. The first of them is in Samarra. And Samarra, as we are all well aware, even recently in 2006, the destruction of the Askariyain shrines in Samarra, lets us know that even to this very day, that area has never been friendly towards the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt. As a matter of fact, Saddam al lain his summer home is in Samarra. That area has always been surrounded and inhabited by those who harbor not just they are of a different creed, but they harbor animosity towards the Ahlul Bayt. And the only Shias that resided in Samarra were the handful of Shia communities that were the keepers of the shrines of the Ahlul Bayt, the custodians of the shrines. A plague hit Samarra. And this plague was killing the people one by one. Until one of the narrations say that the, the custodian of the shrine of Al-Imam Al-Askari called all of the Shia community at the time and he said to them, I have a proposition because the doctors couldn't find a cure. So he said, I have a proposition as to how we can find a cure. They said, and what is this proposition? He said the proposition is the following. We recite Ziyarat Ashura every single night. And we give the thawab of Ziyarat Ashura to Sayyidah Narjis Khatun And in return for us giving her the thawab of Ziyarat Ashura, we ask her to tell her son to pray to Allah to remove the plague because Allah has commanded a son to always be obedient to his mother and the imam if his mother asks him he will definitely not say no and he will pray subhanallah look at the beauty they didn't ask the imam direct because they know that even as scholars the imam can say no to us because we may have sins as a matter of fact we most certainly have sins the sins of a scholar are far greater than the sins of a common man according to the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. Because the common man sometimes doesn't know that they're doing wrong. But if you know you're doing wrong and you commit wrong, your sin is double. right? So they knew that they could not ask the Imam direct. But they knew that they could ask the mother of the Imam to ask the Imam and the Imam would not say no. The traditions say that it became manifest in the community that nobody from the Shia community was dying from this plague. Not a single individual was dying from the Shia community. So those who had animosity to the Ahlul Bayt, not Sunnis, but the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, those who have bughd to Ahlul Bayt, came to the ulama of the Ahlul Shia and they said, what is the remedy that you have that we don't have? They said, Ziyarat to Ashura, gifted to Sayyidah Narjis Khatun with a request that she asks her son to intervene and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove this ailment. They said, can we participate in this? They said, Bismillah, participate. And this is actually not just narrated in the books of the Ahlul Shia, but it is narrated in a book called Tariq Baghdad, which is not written by us. It is written by those who uh, have animosity towards the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam Allah. Even in that book, it says that the plague came to Samarra and this, this happened and because of Ziyarat Ashura gifted to Sayyidina Najis Khatun alayhi salam, the whole situation was resolved. As a matter of fact, our ulama tell us that Imam Jafar al Sadiq alayhi salam, Allah sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad, tells us specifically, most specifically, he says, whenever you visit Sayyid al Shuhada and you want to know that your ziyara is accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you visit Sayyid al-Shuhada you say my intention you make the niyyah nawaitu an azuru sayyidi wa mawlai I intend to visit my master and my lord mawla here lord meant in the lordship of authority sayyidi wa mawlai on behalf of the mother of Sahib al-Asri wal-Amr, Ajallah ta'ala farajah al-Sharif. 
that I am visiting Imam al Hussein alayhi salam Allah on behalf of the mother of the 12th Imam, that the whole thawab of this ziyara is given to her. And then I want her to ask her son to ask Abu Abdullah al Hussein to allow me to be his zuwar. And the Imam alayhi salam Allah says, most certainly that ziyara consider it to be accepted without a shadow of a doubt. Why? Because when the mother of Sahib al-Asr wal-Amr stands before Aba Abdullah al-Husayn alayhi salam Allah to give ziyara to, the, son, to the, the mother of the one who is known as Thar Allah, the one who will take the revenge for Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam Allah as we say, أَيْنَ الطَّالِبِ بِدَمِ الْمَقْتُولِ بِكَرْبَلَى When the mother of the one who is the avenger of Aba Abdullah al-Husayn alayhi salam Allah when the angels come to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam Allah and they say, Ya Aba Abdullah, Muhammad, Hussein, Fatima, Zahra from IEC, Orlando, have traveled all the way to Karbala. And when they came to your shrine, they said, This ziyara is not for them, this ziyara is for the mother of the Mahdi. Will you accept the invitation? Will you allow them to un- enter your shrine or no? You think Aba Abdullah Hussein alayhi salam Allah will say no? Because in that moment, if he denies you, he would be denying the mother of Sahib al-Asri wal-Amr ta'ala faraj al-Sharif. So therefore, it is very important for us to have this connection with Sayyidah Narjeez Khatun alayhi salam Allah, to understand her sabr, to educate our children as they grow about the mother of Sahib al-Asri about how she can intervene. Because she has a manzila with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whenever we seek our imam, we seek him through the wasila of his mother. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasten his reappearance and make us of those who make him proud. Ilahi al ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the wasila of Sayyidina Narjis Khatun alayhi wa ta'ala salatu wa salam. Sallu ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the blessed lady Najis Khatun alayhi salam Allah to hasten the reappearance of our Imam Sahib al-Asr wal-Amr. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have maqfira and rahma on all of our marhumeen, especially the shuhada and the ulama of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have maqfira and rahma on all their souls. Ilahi al ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enrich our poor, to educate the ignorant amongst us, myself included, and to make those who are knowledgeable practicing the knowledge which they have ilahi al ameen we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our children successful in all their educational endeavors that they may become an example and a beacon of the community of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Allah and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the shrines of the Ahlul Bayt and to give a long life to our maraja our ulama so that we may continue to be guided by them ilahi al ameen for our marhumeen and for your marhumeen and for sa'iri marhumeen al-muslimin wal-muslimat wal-mu'minin wal-mu'minat especially the marhumeen of the volunteers who make these events possible let us give them the beautiful gift of surah al-mubarak al-fatiha masbuqatin bis-salawati ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad